Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. Today, the History Guy tells the stories of two little-remembered battles of the Civil War fought west of the Mississippi. The first is one of the earliest battles in the war, where forces met to decide control of the key state of Missouri at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Later in the war, a Confederate general put together a ragtag army to threaten Missouri again and met a Union force at the Battle of Prairie Grove. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. On July 21st, 1861, forces of the Union and the Confederacy met in the first major battle of the United States Civil War. Called the Battle of Bull Run in the north and the Battle of Manassas in the south, the battle dashed early Union hopes of a quick victory over the Confederacy. But mostly what the battle did was illustrate to both sides that the war would be long, expensive, and bloody much less remembered as the second major battle of the United States Civil War. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was notable for several reasons, but like the Battle of Bull Run fought just 20 days before, it would illustrate to both sides that the war would be far more costly than anyone had imagined. The August 10th, 1861 Battle of Wilson's Creek deserves to be remembered. Missouri receives surprisingly scant attention in the general study of the Civil War. It shouldn't. Missouri was more than just a divided border state. Missouri had been admitted as a slave state under the Missouri Compromise in 1821, a decision partly related to the early French colonial history in the area, but also largely to migration following the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. The state had become in many ways the epicenter of the debate between abolition and slavery, with the murder of abolitionist publisher Elijah Lovejoy in 1837, and the central role the state played in the landmark court case Dred Scott v. Sanford, which, among other important rulings, struck down the Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional. By the outbreak of the Civil War, the demographics of Missouri had changed substantially. Slavery was still an important part of the state's economy, and slaves represented nearly 10% of the state's population, but slavery was mostly restricted to the more southern and rural parts of the state. There was a notable abolitionist sentiment that was growing, mostly among the newly arrived Irish and German immigrants. But the largest sentiment was one common to border states, to stay out of the war. On January 21st, 1861, the legislature passed an act calling for a state convention to consider relations between the government of the United States and the government and people of the state of Missouri, and to adopt such measures for vindicating the sovereignty of the state and the protection of its institutions as shall appear to them to be demanded. The act stated that delegates to the convention would be elected by popular vote on February 18th, 1861, and were to convene in Jefferson City on February 28th, 1861. The purpose of the convention was, simply, to consider whether to secede from the Union. But the majority elected supported the Union, and secession was rejected by an overwhelming vote. Missouri was the only state during the U.S. Civil War to call upon a convention to consider secession without actually following through with secession. Rather, the convention preferred a different stance. Remain in the Union, retain slavery in the state, reject violence from both sides, and refuse to provide arms, soldiers, or material support to either. But both the Union and the Confederacy understood that the Mississippi River would be important strategically, making the large city of St. Louis on the Mississippi River a critical military objective. And the people of the state were deeply divided. Like other border states during the war, Missouri would find out that staying out of the war was impossible. Central to the state's position at the time was Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson. Jackson had run in the fall of 1860 as a Douglas Democrat. Stephen Arnold Douglas had run in the 1860 presidential election as a Democrat who supported popular sovereignty, the idea that each state should be allowed to decide for themselves whether to permit slavery within their borders. 
Douglas's position was, essentially, to prevent secession by the South by guaranteeing that the federal government would not involve itself in the issue of slavery. His message failed nationally. Of the four presidential candidates in 1860 to win electoral votes, he earned the least. But his message resonated in Missouri, the only state he won in 1860. To many, the election of Abraham Lincoln essentially guaranteed secession and civil war. But Jackson, elected on a ticket seen as one trying to prevent war, was sympathetic to the cause of the Confederacy and hoped to goad the state into secession. When the Missouri Convention refused secession, he began communications with the President of the Confederacy with a plan to seize St. Louis and, most importantly, the Federal Armory there and hand the state to the Confederacy. Jackson started raising units of the state militia, a right guaranteed under the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Ostensibly, the purpose of the militia was to protect Missouri's neutrality and protect the state from incursions by both federal forces and Confederate forces. But in reality, Jackson had appointed Confederate sympathizers to command in the militia and intended to use the militia to seize the city of St. Louis. Jackson had units of the state militia form around St. Louis to train. Secretly, he negotiated with the Confederacy to provide the militia with heavy artillery needed to breach the thick walls of the federal arsenal. But the plan was derailed by commander of Union forces in St. Louis, Captain Nathaniel Lyon. By some accounts, Lyon, suspecting the militia's purpose, spied on them dressed as a farm woman. Having discovered the artillery, he led a force of pro-Union militia and U.S. regulars and captured the camp, surrounding them and forcing them to surrender. Lyon marched the captured and disarmed men through the city to the arsenal, where he planned to parole them and order them to disperse. But a crowd of pro-Confederate citizens became rowdy and eventually started throwing objects at the Union militia. Eventually, the conflict escalated. By some accounts, a drunk man fired into the Union troops, but other accounts say that the militia fired without provocation. But in the end, 28 civilians were killed, and another 75 wounded in the Camp Jackson affair. While Lyon's action had saved the arsenal, and possibly the state, from Confederate capture, it also raised the state's ire. In May, the legislature passed the Military Bill. The bill reorganized the state militia into the Missouri State Guard and gave Governor Jackson wide power as commander of the Guard. The Guard was placed under the field command of former Missouri Governor Sterling Price and was supposed to defend Missouri territory from incursion by forces of the Union or Confederacy, especially an anticipated invasion by federal forces. The law also forbade the creation of other militias within the state to prevent the recruiting of pro-Union militia like those that had been involved in the Camp Jackson affair. Fearing that Missouri would side to the Confederacy, Brigadier General William Harney, commander of the U.S. Army Department of the West, negotiated an agreement that said, essentially, that the U.S. Army would stay in St. Louis and the Missouri State Guard would control the rest of the state. But the so-called Price-Harney truce could not last. Jackson, who theoretically swore allegiance to the Union and was governor of a state that had rejected secession, openly allowed recruiting for the Confederate Army and did not stop abuses against Union supporters. Harney was called back to Washington, and Lyon was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the Department of the West. Minor battles were fought between the Missouri State Guard and Federal troops in June and July. While little more than skirmishes, the battles of Boonville and Carthage were unique. These were not fought between the Union and the Confederacy, but between the Union and the Missouri State Guard, officially under the authority of a state that had specifically rejected secession. Jackson himself commanded the Missouri State Guard at Carthage. A sitting governor had not commanded troops in battle in the United States since the War of 1812. These small engagements represented a unique war within a war. This was not a fight between the Union and the Confederacy, but a fight between federal troops and Missouri State Guard tasked with protecting Missouri's neutrality. But in reality, Jackson and Price weren't neutral at all. Not only were they Confederate sympathizers, they were negotiating with the Confederacy to facilitate an invasion of Missouri. But the legislature had finally had enough. Meeting again in July, they once again voted against secession, but also declared the governor's office vacant, in essence, exiling Jackson. Hamilton Gamble, who had been chief justice of the Missouri Supreme Court during the Dred Scott case, was appointed governor. By the end of July, Jackson had convinced the Confederate Army to invade Missouri, and Missouri State Guard camped near the southwestern Missouri town of Springfield. The mixed Missouri, Arkansas, and Confederate force numbered some 12,000. Nearby, Lyon was camped with some 5,400 Federals. Realizing that he was outnumbered more than two to one, Lyon planned to retreat to the city of Rolla, some hundred miles away, to await reinforcements. The Confederate force, now in the command of Confederate Brigadier General Benjamin McCullough, planned an attack for November 10th, but the rain on the night of the 9th compelled them to call off the attack. 
but Lyon surprised them in the morning with an attack intended to delay any pursuit of his retreat to Rolla. The attack came on a Confederate camp along a small stream called Wilson's Creek. It was the first major battle of the U.S. Civil War west of the Mississippi. The Federal plan was a surprise attack. Lyon would attack the Confederate camp at dawn, but he had detached some 1,200 men under Colonel Franz Siegel to do a flanking maneuver. It was a risky plan, as it meant splitting a Federal force already outnumbered by the enemy. The two forces would be separated with no clear line of communication. In theory, the Federal forces, although outnumbered, were better trained and equipped than the Confederate force. At first, the Federal plan succeeded. In the confusion of their canceled attack the previous night, the Confederates had neglected to put out pickets and were caught by surprise. Lyon quickly overran the camp, taking the high ground of what would be called Bloody Hill. But a battery of artillery from the Arkansas militia managed to check the Federal advance, allowing Price to organize the Missouri State Guard and prevent a rout. Price attempted to retake the hill in a series of frontal attacks, each repulsed, with heavy losses. Siegel's attack also had initial success, surprising and routing the Confederate cavalry in the camp. But his force was taken by surprise. The Union force included an Iowa Infantry Regiment that wore gray uniforms. When Siegel saw a force approaching, he assumed it was the 1st Iowa, but the men were in fact Confederates of the 3rd Louisiana. Siegel's troops held fire until the force was almost upon them, and Siegel's flank collapsed. Siegel's force was forced to withdraw in disarray. The main Union force on Bloody Hill was now on its own. Lyon, who had been wounded twice in the heavy fighting, tried to lead a counterattack, but was shot through the heart. He was the first Union general officer to be killed in combat in the Civil War. While they still held a defensible position, Major Samuel D. Sturgis, now in command, realized that his troops were running short of ammunition and decided to withdraw. After a six-and-a-half-hour battle, the Confederates held the field. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was notable for a couple of reasons. It was only the second major battle of the war and the first to be fought west of the Mississippi River. Like Bull Run, the defeat shocked the Union, and like Bull Run, the defeat illustrated to both sides that the war would not be easily won. Despite holding the field, the Confederate Army had taken nearly as many casualties as the Union Army had, and short on supply, especially ammunition, and not having faith in the training of the Missouri State Guard, the Confederates were unable to follow up the Union retreat to Rolla. The victory essentially ceded southwest Missouri to the Confederacy, and it facilitated a victory as far north as Lexington, Missouri, but further defeats in October compelled both the Confederate Army and Sterling Price's Missouri State Guard to abandon the state, and a defeat at the Arkansas Battle of Pea Ridge the following March essentially dashed any Confederate hopes of retaking Missouri. Jackson convinced a small group of pro-Confederate delegates to pass an ordinance of secession in October, but the group was never recognized by the majority of the state. The secession government applied for and on November 28, 1861, was granted admission to the Confederacy as the purported 12th state of the Southern Federal Republic. The government in exile sent legislators to the Congress of the Confederate States, and Missouri was represented by the 12th star on the Confederate flag. Jackson himself died of pneumonia in December 1862. But Missouri remained contested throughout the war, and not just by armies, but under the particularly bloody and vicious attacks by and reprisals against the irregular forces called Missouri bushwhackers. Counting small actions, there were more than 1,200 separate engagements inside the borders of the state of Missouri during the Civil War. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and of course some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. Missouri has a really uh, has a unique story in the Civil War, and I mean, to say, I guess you could say that about any state, but I feel like Missouri especially stands out uh, to some extent. Uh, it's it's with the border states. You can compare it to kind of the yeah. ways that some of those other states worked. In other ways, though, I, the war almost started there before it started. Absolutely, else. yeah. As a matter of fact, even if you go farther than that, and there's a lot of ways you could say the war started there, but I mean, the decision, the Missouri Compromise, where Missouri was the only state that was north of the, the line that could be yeah. a slave state, really was indicating where things were going. Uh, and you know, we did another episode a long time ago about uh, 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 an editor out here, his name was Lovejoy, who was, who was killed uh, because he was publishing an abolitionist newspaper in uh, across the border from St. Louis. Uh, and so, I mean, it really was kind of the cross, because, you know, Missouri Missouri is that kind of connection between the east and the west and the north and the south. And that's where those pieces came together. And that's where we saw you know, yeah. the rivalry first. So in a lot of ways, you can see that all, the antecedents to the Civil War were, were moving up in Missouri. So it's not surprising that war was fought there. But I would say you could have people that are very informed about the Civil War and study the Civil War quite a lot who don't even realize that anything occurred 
on the west side of the Mississippi. I mean, that, that trans Mississippi yeah. theater was just a really forgotten theater of the war. Usually when when uh, you talk about like a Western theater of the war, uh, you're talking about Grant yeah, and Grant, his yeah. work on the Mississippi River. It's kind uh, of funny Tennessee to think, and... you know, in terms of America today, that the Western yeah. theater in the Civil War was like, you know, you know, all on the east side of the Mississippi. I mean, there was <laughs> yes. a little in that. I guess they called it the far west. There was a little bit of fighting out, you know, California, New yeah. Mexico. And, and, and we've done a little bit on that stuff. But I'm, but uh, yeah, I, that, that trans Mississippi theater. And, you know, the bottom line is the Union controlled the Mississippi enough for most most of the war that the Confederates yeah. weren't able to do much on that side of it. And that was significant because it meant Texas, which was a huge part of the Confederacy, uh, wasn't able to contribute in many ways that they could have because they were largely, you know, cut off from the rest of the Confederacy by the Mississippi. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that kind of is why uh, both governments knew that Missouri was important. Uh, they knew that the Miss and it had a lot to do with the Mississippi, mm -hmm. uh, but they they knew that control over those ports at uh, St. Louis, for yeah. instance, was really yeah, significant. absolutely. When you, when you talk about the strategic importance, there's other reasons that Missouri is important in terms of. I mean, they they yeah. have the highest percentage of of uh, military age men enlist in the war, uh, and and it was important because it was such a, a state that was so split that actually the population was kind of swinging either way. It wasn't like you know you're fighting on enemy territory, but in terms of the strategic situation, St. Louis was really really the key because the river was so important. And so if the yeah. Confederacy had controlled St. Louis, then that obviously would have been much, much more difficult for the Union to fight Grant's campaign without the without the river. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. so, I mean, that would, St. Louis was really that key just because this major city that really straddled the Mississippi uh, and, and could have uh, completely, you know, uh, controlled that chunk of the Mississippi. Uh, but I mean, most of the fighting wasn't done around St. Louis. Most of the fighting was actually done elsewhere in the state. And then you know, it came down to it was a state where the population was really split in their sympathies. And that meant that it was a state that was kind of up for grabs for both sides. So okay. I, clearly it would have been important for either side to have any other state and the manpower of a state and the, and the you know, the, the resources and the production of a state. Uh, but uh, uh, Missouri was kind of more interesting than a lot of them because, I mean, even in some of the other border states, it really wasn't so much obvious, you know, where the population stood. I mean, Missouri literally said they voted not to secede. Uh, but they voted yeah. really only to stay kind of in the Union in name because they wouldn't even let Union troops uh, exist in the in the state. Uh, and so, I mean, it really was, you know, kind of a, a state where either either side could, and obviously the governor, you know, would rather have gone yeah. with the Confederacy and essentially took the state guard and made them a Confederate Union. So, I mean, it's, it is it's in terms of the war, it's just a, it's a unique position. Uh, in Missouri. Uh, and if you controlled Missouri, I mean, it did, it would have meant something certainly for the Confederates to have some yeah. more uh, trans Mississippi control. Uh, but uh, strategically, the key point of Missouri was, was St. Louis. And if you could have ever shifted the rest of the state, then you might have been able to have the impact on St. Louis. But I mean, the Confederacy never really threatened St. Louis, at least after, you know, Lyons broke up the, you know, the camp, the initial idea that whether they were going to take the federal uh, yeah. arsenal there. It's, it's hard to imagine. Uh, it was important enough to the Union war effort that if they had had to, uh, they would have put more resources yeah. into it. Uh, it would have it would have been a bit of an issue because I mean the Union was stretched too. Yeah, uh, that's why yeah, they kept pulling yeah. people out of that. Yeah, theater, at very but... least, more Confederate activity there would have drawn Union troops away from yeah. doing other things, and that was that was part of the idea too. Was that if the Union had to focus on Missouri, then they couldn't be focusing on Mississippi, you know. Which 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 was a vital a vital piece of it, but yeah, I I try to imagine you know if you control St. Louis, uh, there's there, it's very difficult for you to uh, blockade uh, the Mississippi. Yeah, uh, and the yeah, Union I mean, essentially worked their way Imagine if the Union down. would have had to have run you know batteries at St. Louis every time they yeah. wanted to come you know anywhere from the eastern states or whatever, it would have been significant. Yeah. So I mean they they had no choice but to defend it, and, and it probably did distract troops uh, because even though the you know the battles and there were only a few you know actual battles fought out there. But I mean, the, the bushwhackers, the constant, that, that state was a constant yeah. drain, was a constant fight. And that represented both that the state really had divided sympathies and uh, that it was relevant for the, the Confederacy to continue to have to you know, draw the Union to defend Missouri. I don't I can't think of any other state um, that had the because the, Missouri's governor, Jackson, uh, was really gunning for the the south or he trying was, to yeah. be you know trying to become part I, of the I, south. he tried to I don't support know if... secession and he and he yeah. was, he he had not run as a secessionist he'd run as a no. as, as a uh, you know a douglas uh a democrat is what he ran as a douglas republican you wanted to you know stay out of the war 
popular sovereignty, uh, which is interesting because Missouri and Kansas are proof that popular sovereignty was never going to work. It would have just been a bloody, bloody solution. I mean, because it, it, just like bloody Kansas, if you yeah. left it up to a state to vote whether they're going to be a free state or a, a, yeah, a, they, a they, slave they... state, then they were both could just going to send in partisans on both sides and try to kill each other. But yeah, Kansas. I mean, Kansas was a was a debacle. It, yeah, they, and they it, it, it was proof Kansas that popular for... sovereignty was never going to work. I mean, there, there, yeah, there was just for years. Yeah. Terrible, and uh, you know, and that's the, uh, the uh, you know the guerrilla war that was fought in both of those states is you know it's a war within a war, and and one that was particularly destructive to the civilian population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't think there was any other state. Those the border states didn't have a governor who was usually so at odds with the rest of the government. Yeah. Well, I mean, you um, know, K- Kentucky actually had two governors and two legislatures and two two armies did and they, all that did they stuff. do I mean, they all kind of did but you know really i mean the split was 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 uh i mean kentucky was actually clearly much more a pro-union state missouri you know it's kind of questionable and you know i think it came out in missouri where about sixty thousand maybe fought for the confederates and a hundred thousand fought for the union i mean it was uh it was you know more balanced than you would think in terms of the, where the, where the, the the you know ideas of the population went because you yeah. know it was clearly a slave state and a lot of because of the missouri compromise a lot of people who you know wanted to own slaves had relocated there because it was the only place that you could grow uh, if you you know were were pro-slavery yeah. so i mean it's, there's a lot of reasons that it's interesting and, and honestly these you know these battles the, the battles that were fought there are interesting uh, and it's kind of interesting given that it was not the focus of either side you know that they still yeah. put together you know significant battles uh, you know, out of out of both sides, and that's I mean, if you look at Wilson's Creek, uh, so I, it's it, it's 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 interesting yeah. because it's not just that it was early in the war, but I mean these were two forces that were really not prepared to fight, uh, and yeah. uh, and they you know went and fought anyway, and they, they had supply issues, and they had training issues, and they had uh, communication and command issues, uh, and that's it's it's an interesting theater all around. I mean things were fought differently than they were fought in most of the other side of the Mississippi. Did uh, did Kentucky like Missouri have? I mean, were they admitted to the the confederate yeah, states kentucky had never... a flag on the on the, or a star on the flag uh and they had uh, representatives there uh and uh yeah and i think we uh uh there's another uh episode where we talk about that we talk about K- kentucky during the uh the, yeah. during the civil war but uh yeah so there i mean there there were a few that had kind of that divided loyalty on the borders and of course virginia split you know between virginia and west yeah. virginia and so I, I so it's not like it was absolutely unique but i mean there was something unique about missouri and that a slave state that was you know north of the line uh, and uh, and therefore you really ha- and had a lot of uh, immigrant population. A lot of the a lot of the uh, pro-union or the anti-slavery forces were German immigrants, and uh, German Irish immigrants that were coming in. And yeah. so I mean it was it's it's it was unique f- culturally from the rest of the nation uh, f- for various reasons. But it was also unique in the war because that was just not the theater where the war was generally fought. And and so it, yeah. the war was fought a little differently on that side. Uh, and uh, Wilson's Creek, by the way, which is really kind of cool. But if you're in Springfield, Missouri, which is uh, uh, down in southwestern Missouri, I mean, the battlefield is literally in the middle of town, and it's a, it's a national park. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you can just you know walk there on a walking trail, and so it's it's a really well taken care of place. It's a one it's a battlefield site a lot of people don't visit, but I mean, it's very easy to visit, uh, and it's uh, uh, very well uh, described. I mean, even though you know I was there during COVID when the, the visitor center wasn't open, but I mean, it's 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 really easy to follow the track of the battle, just following the you know the the path that they've given, uh, and it's a well preserved battlefield to, to, so that you can really get a feel for the train and what was going on uh and, yeah. and so it was it was really fun to go down there but it's also to see you know this is this is interesting terrain to fight a battle on too i mean missouri's fairly rugged yeah it's it's an interesting uh it's it's i i think it's really cool to be able to you know visit these these mm-hmm. sites and see some of this stuff especially when they're well taken care of yeah. we got we got to do some of that in virginia with uh, revolutionary battles too yeah um it's but it's interesting that's right in the middle of town you think of but it was much more uh at wilderness. I mean, at the, at the, not necessarily yeah. completely at the time, but I, oh, yeah, Missouri yeah. Springfield has was grown not a big, lot yeah, since... when it was fought. <laughs> yeah, it didn't write well. It was very close to town. I mean, you would say it was very close to town, but yeah. I mean, it was, it was a couple of small farms and those farmhouses are still there. That's kind of interesting too. Uh, oh, so that you can, yeah. you really can get a feel for the battle of Wilson's Creek. I, I, I really do highly recommend that battlefield. I think it's one that's not on a lot of, uh, you know, civil war battlefield list of things that you would go to that I would say is very much worth your time and very easy to visit. But uh, you're right. I mean, it was fought, you know, uh, they, they just kind of bumped into each other where they were. It wasn't fighting over a particular piece of ground. Uh, it really was the Confederates were planning to chase the Union, uh, and a lion decided that he was going to uh, uh, do a surprise attack at night to try to delay that. You know, it was not a battle where anybody expected to fight a battle there. 
Uh, but I mean, it's interesting ground and the high ground there where it was fought. I mean, you can really see what that would have meant with the Confederates kind of charging up that hill all day uh, and how difficult yeah. that must have been. Yeah. I mean, the Union fought essentially until they're almost out of ammunition there. You can feel for, you know, where it was. You can stand where the batteries were and see really how much of a command of the battlefield they had and how, how terrifying that must have been. And yeah, it's uh, I really enjoyed the visit. I would say that. And but it does also I mean, it shows you kind of the nature of the of the, the fight that was fought out in the in the trans Mississippi. Yeah. Ultimately, it was a, it was a reasonably bloody battle for for being yeah. what it was. Yeah. And uh, the first battle where a Union general was killed. Yeah. I mean, he died straight up yeah. in his troops for all. I mean, there's a lot of things you could say wrong with him and how he handled what happened in St. Louis and everything. I mean, but he he was brave. Uh, you know, it's hard to yeah, it's hard not to second guess him dividing his forces in the face of the enemy. And, and yeah, you know, he made some interesting choices there. Uh, but I mean, that, he he died leading from the front and, you know, shot through the heart. And uh, and it was a uh, I mean, there about equal casualties on both sides and, a you know, a particularly nasty, you know, little battle that, you know, really at the beginning when people didn't really know what the war was about. I mean, this is it's it's very much like Bull Run. I mean, this is this is before yeah. they had really gotten inured to the casualties and all that sort of stuff. It'd been a long time since there had been like serious yeah. fighting on. I mean, what since 1812, really, yeah, since yeah, there was yeah, were, uh, yeah. fighting on on American soil. Yeah, yeah aside even, from even Winfield even the... Scott, there weren't a lot of people yeah. involved in the Civil War who had any recollection of fighting. Well, no, the Mexican War. I mean, there were quite they, a few yeah, officers who started the war, war yeah. with Mexico. Yeah, but I mean, the, yeah, the uh, yeah, we did. I especially, you know, fighting. Um, you know, we haven't fought on our territory since too. But yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, I I don't think those troops walking into it were prepared for what they were going to see. You know, because it was that early in the war, and they they all. Yeah fought bravely they really did i mean in the end you know the union withdrew after line was killed and after you know after certain setbacks uh, and then they uh, uh had to leave they were also running out of ammunition uh but uh, so i mean the, the confederates held the field in the end but i mean it was really a battle that was fought to a bloody standstill and neither side yeah. panicked or ran or anything like that uh, and so it's uh, you know it's just when you want to think about you know who why would you walk into a fight uh, then that's one of those places to think. I mean, the war was barely started. And probably a lot of them weren't really yeah. sure on what the loyalties were or what they were fighting over and probably weren't expecting that they were walking into a battle. And uh, this is where the nation started to learn really what it meant uh, to be fighting this war that would, you know, then go on for another four years and bloody, bloody war. And that they were going to have, I mean, significant engagements even far away from the you know missouri even at the time was was a fairly distant uh, yeah actually many of these troops that fought there at wilson's creek ended up you know on the on the eastern side of it and fought yeah. you know, all the way into the you know on the, on the larger campaigns you know by not by any means the largest battle that should ever be but i mean it certainly was a major battle uh and uh, and that they you know that they thought that it could actually be much worse uh, i mean that yeah if you were fighting at Wilson's Creek, you were right there at the beginning of the war. And if you were still fighting in 1864, then you had, you know, you had seen an awful lot of, of war. In some ways, you know, when we, you look at the Civil War now, sometimes I think people get this idea that it was inevitable that the North was going to win. And it's easier to say that with hindsight when you can see the weight uh, mm -hmm. of the of the northern of the north's advantages but i think you know wilson's creek was a good example of why uh, it it wasn't even necessarily a given that they were going to be able to control missouri um yeah i i think that it, you know i mean it would have been a very different war if the confederates had been able to to truly take advantage of of wilson's creek yeah. and force troops yeah, uh, yeah. To if, the it, west if, there. if the confederates had been in a position where they could have followed up on the union retreat uh, then they could have, yeah. you know, essentially eliminated Union forces in the Trans-Mississippi. Uh, and that, you know, it's hard to say how that would have affected, but I mean, it could have actually have impacted the war. So it's it's easy to look on the broad scale and say, you know, the Union had, you know, more resources in a number of different ways. Uh, but it's uh, if you go down and you look at individual battles and what happened at individual battles, you know, you find, you know, Gettysburg was really quite a close battle. And, uh, you know, yeah. what what would that have meant? Uh, and there were a number of battles that were that way. They actually could have significantly shifted the war. So you know, I don't know what would happen if the if the Confederates had taken Missouri and, and essentially eliminated the, uh, the the Union in the you know in Missouri that early on. But certainly would have been a different war. Would have meant yeah. that the Union would have to send uh, far more resources to the West than they ended up doing. Uh, and so that certainly would have delayed then Grant's campaign down the Mississippi. And you know everything's different that way. So it's it's easy to see how how little things turned on. And you know Wilson speaks yeah. interesting because it was a it was a confederate victory but i mean uh, and, and not necessarily a pyrrhic victory i mean they, they weren't devastated no. but it was it was a victory so narrow that they weren't in a position to be able to take full advantage of the victory well and they were uh, it starts kind of the i think one of the stories of the trans mississippi theater is that there's just 
uh, there was rarely any more supply. Mm -hmm. They essentially use uh, both sides tended to use everything they had. And, you know, at the, at the end of the battle, uh, but the South's victory there did allow them to control a good chunk of Missouri for, for, for yeah, yeah, Southwest the, Missouri, the for, for a period of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it's, so it certainly, it certainly had meaning. Uh, but again, uh, strategically, what was important about Missouri was St. Louis, and and the, yeah. this didn't really move them in a position where they were going to be able to challenge St. Louis. There was another yeah. effort too to come up and try to tank St. Louis later in the war, and they, you know they found out it was by then defended with fortifications, and which is something they couldn't do. Uh, and yeah. so, I mean, it's a, a it's an interesting battle, and it was an important battle in its time. Uh, and it's uh, in, in many ways, I think it you know strategically it comes out as a Union victory, even though uh, the, the Confederate uh, certainly gained advantage yeah. from what happened. And and it's uh, it just such a it's a period of the war that's talked about a lot less because it's so early. It's an area in the war that's talked about a lot less because people don't talk as much about the Trans Mississippi. Uh, and it's it deserves to be remembered. I mean, it deserves not to be forgotten just because there were bigger battles fought in other places. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Yeah, I just watched, I mean, I was picking through the history ones, and uh, the, the, the one I watched is called Lost Voyage of the 499. Uh, and it really was a chunk of history I knew almost nothing about. But the, the story is that uh, in the 1860s, uh, there were quite a lot of of uh, people from China uh, that were that went to New Zealand to work in the gold mines. The, the initial gold rush in New, New Zealand faded quickly because it wasn't mostly pay, placer gold. It was going to require hard rock mining. Uh, and so they ended up making appeals to get labor from China for people that were willing to work hard to get the gold. And so you had a large Chinese population. And still today, around 5% of the population of New Zealand are, are they call them Chinese New Zealanders. So so you had, a, and it was, of course, you know, deadly, dangerous work. And so uh, th there were a number of people who came from China to New Zealand and died there. And culturally in China, it's important to be buried in your homeland. Uh, and so at some point, uh, families from China raised enough money to disinter almost 500 uh, men that had been born in China, had gone to New Zealand, had died on the gold fields, uh, and to put them on a boat and take them back to China. And the boat went and sank. Uh, and so this is, this is descendants of uh, one of the people that, that whose remains were on that boat, who was actually important to New Zealand, he was really one of the founding fathers of New, New Zealand. He was a, he was a Chinese merchant uh, during the time of the gold rush, and had very much built a lot of the the, the economy. And and uh, and then he was on that boat uh, and trying to figure out what happened to these remains and to try to find some sort of uh, you know cultural spiritual peace based on what was lost. It's I mean you could see the mix of it because something I one of the things that was kind of fascinating to me is I've never heard anybody speaking English. Uh, with a Chinese New Zealand accent. But uh, it, it really is, it talks, I mean, it's got a lot of heart to it, but it's also a chunk of history, you know, uh, that deserves to be remembered uh, that is largely forgotten. So it's called Last Voyage of the 499, totally worth your time. Uh, and absolutely a, a fascinating piece of history and how that history impacted people. Uh, and then also a lot about how, you know, people deal with mortal remains and their ancestors and, and you know, how they, wow. they, they celebrate their life and, and how they uh, respect them in death. What have you been watching lately on Magellan? So I watched, uh, it's called Wheels of Power, and it's a history of official cars. Uh, it first talked about uh, Hitler's cars. And he had a very, I mean, he had a particular car. It used all kinds of special uh technology and stuff like that it was it was really quite interesting and they and they also talked about a number of other cars they talked about uh, charles de gaulle's he wanted one kind of car uh, had no uh, bulletproof armor or anything like that and they did try to assassinate him while he was in it uh, apparently they're just bad shots <laughs> that's what he said he he said they must suck at shooting because they didn't hit me but he, his car had some some unique stuff it had a hydraulic suspension uh, so it, it could the car could have driven if it only had three wheels and it would still be able to drive on on a flat huh. and so it was a, it was a really interesting car and it's kind of interesting to see how some of these people had uh relationships with their cars because then it also it also talked about uh, the beast which is the the american there's actually multiple beasts which are these mm -hmm. american president cars that have kind of come since uh jfk yeah and so they're always heavily armored yeah it's hard, of, it's hard uh, to imagine jfk he was you know sitting in an open car driving yeah. down and that, that that's how yeah, we, the, uh, innocent we were of course jfk changed our entire perception of that yeah yeah, one of the first things they did was stopped having convertibles. So that was the and so now I we don't know we actually don't know a whole lot about how the the beast is built. We've got some ideas, but like they specifically keep all that. Oh yeah, so I would, that you I don't would hope know. so. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and then it also talks about the Pope Mobile, uh-huh. which also now has bulletproof glass because yeah, it yeah. didn't, and someone shot someone shot John Paul II. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's it's a really it's a really interesting way to look at a piece of history that I hadn't really thought about. I mean, numerous parts of it kind of sounded like the kind of stuff we might talk about on the on the history guy, where we were telling real specific histories. I had never considered a history of the Pope Mobile. Um, well, absolutely, <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I think it's really cool to watch because it connects to a lot of different pieces of history that uh, I think we don't think about a lot. Yeah, I tell you what, it's always just uh, it's always just amazing the variety of things you get to pick from on Magellan TV, and how you, I mean, yeah. something you didn't go there searching for that, but you just went there searching for something to watch, and you found something you knew nothing about. Uh, and you know, here they've got a great video on it. So I mean, it's yeah. I, I love my subscription to Magellan TV, and one of the reasons is that you know that sounds fascinating. I'm gonna have to go watch it. If you're gonna watch TV, you might as well be learning something, right? And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, The History Guy talks about the Battle of Prairie Grove, which ended Confederate hopes for control of Missouri. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the history guy. On December 7th, 1862, Confederate forces under the command of Thomas Hindman marched against a Union force in northwestern Arkansas. Determined to shift the tide of the war in this far western part of the conflict, Hindman hoped to drive those Union forces out of Arkansas for good. On the other side was a Union division under the command of General James Blunt, and the two armies would meet outside the small town of Prairie Grove, Arkansas. Though far from one of the most famous battles of the war, the Battle of Prairie Grove had significant consequences for the war west of the Mississippi. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Most of the more famous battles of the U.S. Civil War took place east of the Mississippi, while the most famous western campaign was General Grant's along the Mississippi River, which culminated in the siege at Vicksburg. Fighting west of the Mississippi is considered part of a different theater, the Trans-Mississippi Theater, which covers most of the western United States, with the exception of the Pacific Coast. While not as seriously studied, the theater of war was not without serious fighting, especially over Missouri, a slave state which remained in Union hands for the duration of the war. On January 3, 1861, Claiborne Fox Jackson assumed the governorship of Missouri. He ran as a Democrat, supporting Stephen Douglas' anti-secession platform. However, Jackson immediately began working surreptitiously for the state's secession. Already, South Carolina had seceded, and six days later it would be followed by Mississippi. On February 8th, 7th, secessionist states agreed to the provisional constitution of the Confederate states. Jackson had called for a state convention to decide the issue of secession, but the delegates refused, 98 to 1. Jackson declared that the state would remain an armed neutral, refusing to provide arms or soldiers to either side. When Lincoln called for the states to provide soldiers for the war effort, Jackson answered that your requisition, in my judgment, is illegal, unconstitutional, and revolutionary in its object, inhuman and diabolical, and cannot be complied with. Not one man will the state of Missouri furnish to carry on an unholy crusade. The governor was simultaneously hoping to stage a military coup to seize Missouri for the Confederacy, speaking to President Jefferson Davis about a plan to seize the U.S. arsenal at St. Louis. Still professing neutrality, he was actively asking for a Confederate invasion of the state and promised his Missouri Guard would support it. Instead, the Union forces moved, seizing Jefferson City on June 13th. Confederate forces won victories at several minor battles, but the Union forces proved to be too great, driving the pro-Confederate forces into Arkansas. In March of 1862, the Confederacy attempted a campaign to push the Union out of Arkansas, but was defeated at the Battle of Pea Ridge. For a time, that defeat seemed to end Confederate efforts to control northern Arkansas or counterattack in Missouri. Union and Confederate forces both were moved east of the Mississippi. Union forces in Missouri were dealing with an intense guerrilla campaign, unable to press south. The Army of the Frontier was formed to defend southwest Missouri in October. On November 20th, John Schofield was forced by medical issues to give up command of the Army of the Frontier. Command passed to Brigadier General James G. Blunt, then in command of one of the Army's three divisions. At that time, the Army was split, with Blunt's division in Arkansas, while the remaining two divisions were positioned in Missouri at Wilson's Creek. Blunt was a physician who was involved in the anti-slavery forces in Kansas during the fighting called Bleeding Kansas prior to the war. Blunt's unit was unique in 1862. Called the Kansas Division, it was made up mostly of Kansans, but also included the first two African-American regiments raised for the Union, the 1st and 2nd Kansas, as well as three regiments of Native Americans. 
In August of 1862, Confederate General Thomas C. Hinman had been ordered to organize an army in Arkansas that could capture Missouri. Hinman had previously been in command of the entire Trans-Mississippi until his efforts to invigorate the forces there aroused political opposition. Hinman was from a fairly wealthy southern family, which settled in Mississippi, and had served during the Mexican-American War, reaching the rank of lieutenant, but not participating in any major action. He was elected as a U.S. representative for Arkansas in 1858, was a vocal firebrand and secessionist. He was replaced by Theophilus Granny Holmes. Hinman got a field command and began recruiting what would become Hinman's Legion. His work was nothing short of a miracle. In an area low on troops and weapons, he assembled a patchwork but significant force that could threaten the Union's hold of Missouri, and in only two months. Historian William Shea called it an achievement without parallel in the Civil War. Prior to the battle, there was significant maneuvering on the part of both armies. Hinman got far enough into Missouri to threaten Springfield, but lost his chance when Granny Holmes recalled him to Little Rock. Hinman's legion remained in Missouri, but found itself seriously outmaneuvered, had to withdraw. Blunt's division came to contract with Confederate cavalry in early November at Cane Hill. Though quickly chased off, Hinman sent a new force of around 2,000 men to occupy the hill. When Blunt learned of it, he immediately set about attacking the inferior force. In addition to outnumbering the Confederates, his own force consisting of about 5,000 men, the Confederate force had only six cannons to Blunt's 30, and the Union force was much better equipped. The short battle on November 28th resulted in the Confederate force being chased off. To attack the force at Cane Hill, Blunt had further separated himself from the two Missouri divisions, and Hinman saw an opportunity. Hinman moved his entire force, some 11,000 men, to attack Blunt's while he was isolated. Blunt learned of Hinman's plans by December 2nd and sent telegraphs reporting the situation and requesting reinforcements. Hinman hoped to oppose Blunt and outmaneuver him, hoping to attack with superior numbers, his force both in the front and at his flanks. Blunt had his troops on high alert as he waited for Hinman's army. The two Missouri divisions, under the command of Francis J. Heron, began marching immediately upon receipt of Blunt's telegraph for help, on an epic of human endurance. The two divisions marched over 100 miles in frigid winter weather, averaging 30 miles a day. According to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, the average generally was between 8 and 13 miles a day. Hinman had hoped to strike as quickly as possible, but bad weather delayed his troops so that he wasn't ready to attack until December 7th. December 6th saw the first skirmishes between cavalry units. Realizing that Heron's force was near, Hinman changed his plans on the eve of December 7th, planning to hurry north and attack Heron's divisions first, before swinging around to attack Blunt's division. Hinman's troops again moving at 4 a.m. on the 7th. Ahead of the main body, 2,000 Confederate cavalry met and routed several regiments of Union cavalry near Prairie Grove, giving chase across the Illinois River until they met with advanced elements of Heron's divisions. Heron pressed on, and the Confederate cavalry withdrew. When Hinman's first division of 6,300 men reached Prairie Grove, he began to have doubts about his plan. Instead of moving to attack Heron, Hinman ordered the division to take a defensive position against the possible arrival of Blunt's division. The next division of about 3,200 arrived and took up a defensive position as well. Meanwhile, Blunt's scouts had detected Hinman's maneuver early in the morning, but the message failed to reach Blunt, who didn't begin marching until 10 a.m. Meaning to reach Prairie Grove, the front brigade erred on its destination, turning on a road towards Rhea's Mill. Though the mistake cost Blunt time, it allowed his division to approach Prairie Grove by the least defended route. By 2.30 p.m., his division was on the march from Rhea's Mill to Prairie Grove, where the roar of cannon could already be heard. Heron's divisions had reached Prairie Grove in the morning, began an artillery bombardment on the high ground where Hinman's army waited. The Confederate artillery lacked the range to effectively return fire and was too low on ammunition to keep up a sustained fire. Heron ordered his two brigades to attack the Confederate line. Fighting fell mostly on the 20th Wisconsin and 19th Iowa regiments, which overran a Confederate artillery battery but were repulsed by a counterattack. The two regiments suffered casualties of about 50%. A member of the 19th Iowa wrote that the battle had raged before with fury. Now it was terrific, and until dark, the battle raged with all its terror. More Union regiments struck the same part of the line, with the 37th Illinois securing the Confederate battery at second time. John Black of the 37th would be awarded a Medal of Honor for leading the attack which managed to capture another Confederate battery despite Black being wounded in the arm in the action. His brother would be awarded a Medal of Honor for actions at the earlier Battle of Pea Ridge, making the Black brothers the first pair of siblings to earn Medals of Honor. His brother, William Black, described the counterattack at Borden House, writing that the rebels came down like a cloud into the valley in pursuit. But just as they withdrew, they repulsed the counterattack with Union artillery. We had the rebels now, just where we'd always wanted them, on level clear ground, and we felt now was an hour of vengeance. At 3.15, Blunt arrived at the battle with his staff, his division close behind. Blunt opened fire first with his artillery, and the Confederate line adjusted to face the new threat. 
Blunt's first assault by the 20th Iowa and the first Indian Home Guard was repulsed, and a series of attacks and counterattacks followed. The air thick with bullets. The situation became somewhat dire when around a thousand federal troops became separated from the line. Confederate counterattack by three times as many soldiers nearly overran the Union troops. Blunt's howitzers were able to blunt the charge, but the withdrawal was costly. Hinman has been criticized for leaving the actual battle command to his subordinates, and as evening came before 5 p.m., a Confederate brigade commander, Mosby Parsons, a native Missourian, made a decision. He determined to charge the enemy with bayonet. Parsons hoped to make a decisive attack and end the battle. Rushing as dark fell, his charge was confused, failed to come full to bear. Still, his men charged a Union line. It was then pandemonium broke loose, wrote a Kansan infantryman. The Federal artillery loosed infernal contents of grape and canister shot, followed by infantry volleys, which shredded Parsons' lead units. Nearly half would be wounded or killed. It was the Confederates' last counterattack. While the fighting had been inconclusive, Hinman now faced an almost even Union force, which was further being reinforced by troops that were trickling in after Heron's forced march. There were no reinforcements for him, and his units were running low on ammunition and food. Now the day of fighting would spell catastrophe for his legion. Still, he announced that at dark the battle closed, leaving us masters of every foot of the ground on which it was fought. Hinman ordered his men to withdraw. Confederate soldiers were dismayed. One Arkansan wrote that they retreated with mortification from a field gallantly won. Another wrote that we have whipped the foe and we are being told to retreat anyway. Others were perhaps more realistic, with one admitting that had we remained one day longer, we would have nearly starved. Pursuing Union cavalry reported that the Confederates were pulling bark off of trees to eat and that grapevines of two or three inches in diameter were gnawed clear off. Demoralized, the Confederate forces suffered seriously from desertions and were forced to leave their wounded and dead. Leaving them was not an easy choice. The area was full of feral hogs, so-called razorbacks, and the threat was so serious that they left the wounded in groups with loaded revolvers, surrounded the pile dead with fence rails. Some of the Federal troops, unfamiliar with the threat, dubbed them slaughter pens. Compared to the major battles of the war, the casualties in the Battle of Prairie Grove were relatively light, with the Union reporting 175 dead, 813 wounded, and 263 missing, to the Confederates 164 dead, 817 wounded, and 336 missing. But the battle did represent the, the last serious Confederate threat to Union control over northern Arkansas and Missouri, although Blunt's force would fight one more small battle, defeating the Confederates in the Battle of Van Buren later in the month. The battle was significant for a couple of reasons. It ended Confederate hopes for control of Missouri, and it showed the precarious position of the Confederate armies at that point. The Confederates were barely able to field effective forces in Arkansas when they were fighting already on so many fronts. And the Trans-Mississippi Theater would essentially be cut off with the successful conclusion of Grant's Vicksburg campaign, leaving some 30,000 Confederate troops stranded. So Wilson's Creek was, you know, one of the first battles in the West and probably the first major one, you would say, in the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Yeah. Uh, Prairie Grove is one of the last yeah. major engagements. And we, we kind of skip in between their, uh, the, the, the major campaign at Pea Ridge, yeah. where, uh, where they, there was a lot of maneuvering and stuff there. Uh, someday um, we'll probably have an episode out on Pea Ridge. Yeah. Too, yeah, but... It's another, it's another really interesting, an interesting story in the we're actually. So yeah, the three, that's that the campaign. one that's much better known, I would imagine, because we're, yeah. you know, when we talk about history, I think that these are probably the two that were less known. Prairie Grove was kind of the the end of there being any chance that the Confederates were going to yeah. be able to. It's it's it almost uh, kind of surprising that it. the Confederates were able even to field an army at Prairie yeah. Grove, uh, and in the end, you know, it was very much like what happened at Wilson's Creek. In the end, they held the field, uh, but they didn't have. I mean, they had to abandon the field because they were simply out of supply, uh, and uh, that's yeah. essentially kind of what happened at, uh, at at Wilson's Creek. So, I mean, it's kind of fascinating to see these two bookend the you know the Trans Mississippi Theater. Uh, because yeah. they kind of they kind of work out that. In this. But uh, what you would say is, is similar between the two, though, is in both of them, the Confederates were in desperate uh, situation in terms of supply when the battle began. Yeah, I, he was he was really only I mean, they call it a miracle that that uh, the commander there was able to put together yeah. uh, an army. Was that was that Thomas Hindman who who commanded there? Um, it, it was really, really quite impressive that he was able to put together a force that that, that could even that could even reasonably contest the, the small number. Of, tr of Union troops that were there, mm -hmm. but he he put it together at th honestly through sheer force of will, and it would have been significant if he'd been able to to soundly defeat the Union forces yeah, there. Yeah, would have at least kept Union forces engaged. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, that, it could have distracted resources. It could. I mean, it's hard to say exactly yeah. where it could have gone because I mean, 
still, you know, the bottom line is it would have been very difficult for the Confederacy to be able to challenge the fortifications that had been built around St. Louis, which was still a key in, yeah. in the Trans-Mississippi. But, I mean, you're talking about a lot of resources on that side of the river. Uh, and, yeah. you know, it's, it's it, these, there, you know, in every war you've got some of these, you've got these secondary theaters uh, that uh, get much smaller resources but can still be very important to the war. Uh, and you got people with kind of ragtag, lesser trained troops and often, you know, second class equipment. Uh, and they end up, you know, it ends up being a very, you know, brave contest. Uh, and so this yeah. is this is a story like that. And, and as a battle, it's really a very interesting battle. Troops are kind of stumbling into each other. You're, you know, the Union forces are kind of coming in piecemeal. Uh, there's points where, you know, it, things are really quite surprising. You know, if something hadn't come this direction or hadn't come that direction, it could have made a big difference. Uh, and so it's really a, 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 a strategically, uh, you know, it's it's hard to say, you know, all would have happened. But I mean, tactically, it's a very right. interesting yeah. battle as well. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, if, it's... if the Confederates had had won. Uh, which in many ways they did. I mean, they, they kind of yeah. called it a victory because they said they held the ground. But if the Confederates had, you know, been able to actually defeat the Union force and force them to retreat, you know, how far could they have gone? I mean, they were eating, they were literally eating the bark off of trees. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, exactly what it meant. But I mean, it was, uh, it, it certainly represented the Confederates' last gasp in the Trans-Mississippi. Uh, and they did, uh, you know, surprisingly well for being a last gasp in the Trans-Mississippi. And so it makes yeah. an interesting battle. It is a fair point that, you know, they, they, <laughs> that army wasn't going to be able to stay together uh, much longer, regardless of the outcome of the battle there. They just couldn't, they, there were, there weren't any supplies. They didn't have particularly good control. They still had control of the, the Southern Mississippi, uh, but not especially great control, <laughs> not fully uncontested. I, it would have been difficult. And also the South honestly just couldn't uh, spare. Yeah, they were putting their resources down in Vicksburg. And, and it kind of reminds me of the, we talked about one of the far West battles too. And, you know, Sibley's all caught yeah. in New Mexico and, and uh, uh, the Glorietta Pass. And, you know, by the time of Glorieta Pass, they had exceeded their supply lines. And, you know, they, you know, essentially, then when you're defeated, you have nothing to retreat on. And that's, yeah. you know, that can be a, a terrible disaster. So I, it's a it's an entirely different point in the war than Wilson's Creek. They're different armies who I think have a much better idea, you know, what's going on with the war and, and you know, what they're in for. Uh, and they still show up and they still fight in these, you know, desperate battles. Uh, and they're still, especially in that time, I mean, it's probably still true today, but I mean, you know, there's just an awful lot of confusion in that battle where you didn't really know who, oh, yeah. was, who was attacking from where. Uh, and uh, so I, it's a, it's a fascinating fascinating battle to discuss. And it, does, it, it again shows that the Trans-Mississippi Theater remained you know, at least a place that was distracting resources, you know, uh, yeah. much later into the war. It's uh, the fighting there. I mean, to some extent, you know, the fighting was the same. You had charges, you had bayonets, you had the muskets and the artillery. Uh, but it was, I think, because of the fact that they were always going to, they were never relying on large armies. Mm -hmm. And Ultimately, a lot of the battles, you know, fought in the East, ultimately, where where they happened, once the battle was engaged, then both sides spent all that time trying to get any any force nearby to join to join that battle so that you could have your full force to bear. And these were places where, I mean, honestly, both sides pretty much had their whole force. Yeah, uh, I didn't have engaged. to bear. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, but it's kind still... of because Union, the Union was receiving reinforcements, and that's one of the reasons that the, the Confederates eventually had to abandon the battlefields, that they know the odds were just yeah. going to continue to shift. Uh, but, uh, and so, I mean, we're seeing more here that there's a greater weight of Union, and that might have to do with how important it was uh, that uh, over the, the most of the rest of the course of the war, the Union had enough control over Missouri that they were able to you know, gain more resources in the, in, in the Trans-Mississippi. Yeah. But uh, it, it is certainly still, yeah, you're right, you're out on the edge. You know, you don't have a lot of places that you can look. You don't have a lot of places you can retreat to. And, and uh, so that no. makes for a different kind of battle. In some ways, you can see the way uh, the ways that the Union was had the advantages that the South didn't. Uh, the Union had better ammunition mm -hmm. uh that this battle the the south couldn't even i uh, really couldn't even keep their much worse artillery they didn't have as good uh good cannons they had way fewer of them yeah that's, and they that's certainly fire them all well uh, way during the course of the war the union had yeah. uh, not just uh higher caliber cannons more modern cannons uh, but they also the union had enough cannons that they could make their batteries were generally consistent in the size of gun uh which made it a lot easier to supply the confederates never really got to a point where they could manage to do that and so you're even when you had a battery it likely had guns of two or three calibers that made it much more difficult to yeah. supply and they were probably smaller guns by that time of the war and you know all that's starting to show by that by the way it's yeah. starting to show more and more the, that kind of the the advantage of the industrial advantage of the north 
and the Union artillery was was significant at this yeah. battle. Uh, it was yeah. was performing was way outperforming the the Confederate artillery. Yeah. Uh, but certainly the the infantry was. Uh, but the North was the one that ended up mostly striking, mostly doing the attacking. And they, I mean, they struggled. There was some significant casualties. It's one of those um, battles where your enemy had a better ground and you were obligated yeah. to try to take it against the better ground. And so, yeah. I, mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that the Union artillery really did save the battle for the Union. It's it's an interesting point, too, that uh, the Confederate plan had been to, because, again, the Union split their forces, uh, which could have been a great advantage for the Confederates, but they weren't able to strike the one force and then turn and strike the other force separately they didn't they weren't able to fight them piecemeal partially that was because uh, uh the union forces were where they they moved quicker than the confederates thought they were going to be able to and despite uh the mix up in orders which is why they where they turned down the wrong road and <laughs> ended up showing up late to the battle uh they still they still were ultimately able to bring both forces to bear and the south really uh, didn't have the numbers to dominate both the whole the, the combined union forces and you're, you're right there were still troops because they the the one union force had marched so quickly uh, that there were still troops trailing in yeah and the confederates simply i mean at some point they just wouldn't have had bullets to yeah hold off another union attack well and, uh, apparently we're on the verge of starvation i mean literally on the verge yeah. of starvation yeah the some of the stories about you know what happens after the battle they talk about these razorbacks which are apparently just uh, absolute absolutely nightmarish imagine we'll, we'll imagine being you know living. wounded in battle and then attacked by the wild pig that's terrifying uh, that absolutely absolutely they were horrific. arming their wounded so with they're... pistols to protect them from the pigs yeah that's a uh, yeah, yeah that's that it is kind of a terrifying even to think of uh, you know <laughs> that you had to that you had to protect your your dead so that they could be buried yeah. from the wildlife yeah though i mean there's yeah, uh, a... there's other places you know there's a, there's a fairly famous battle in the second world war where japanese troops retreated through what was supposedly crocodile infested waters and yeah, there's some argument that. whether the numbers are as big as people claim but i mean you know the the they're there have been times when things didn't work out so well, you know. That was that was uh, New Guinea, I think, was is where that was. Uh, and then there's there's also, I mean, there's plenty of stories too about wounded soldiers uh, getting caught in fires. And uh, there was a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, in several battles in the like in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. And the stuff fires like that. And, started because the battle started a fire, and then you're you know you're yeah. unable to extricate yourself, and the woods are on fire. Yeah. It's, so I mean, it's yeah. yeah I mean, uh, war is terrible. Uh, yeah. And in some ways, uh, I mean, there, there were it, this wasn't a place of slaughter in the same way, levels like Shiloh. But uh, yeah. I mean, in some ways, it's more when you're out farther out and there's fewer resources and et cetera. In some ways, it's more terrible. I mean, you are farther from any sort of assistance. And it was ultimately, I mean, the, the Hinman's uh, legion there ends up staying together somewhat because I think they go and serve. They pull them and they serve in the east, uh, the remnants of it. But it was... Uh, it sounds like having to give up that field when you when you hear some of the, the soldiers talking about it. That was it was devastating yeah. to you feel fought, like you, you fought won a and you died so hard to hold this ground. And then, you know, in the end, you know, you can't hold it and you just have to walk away from ground that your you know, your friends died to preserve. But again, that story, you hear that story also, you know, in the Second World War, you hear that story. I mean, that's, it's not that's not a unique story of war. It's it. it and so I, even if you talk about, you know, the bravery and the honor and, the, you know, of, of war and that sort of stuff, uh, even still, it comes out to be it can be just uh, uh, it's exhausting yeah. to someone who even, you know, thinks that there's a cause that they're fighting for. So, I, I, yeah. you know, I mean, war is one of the things that we learn from history is that war is terrible. And this is, you know, one of the examples of that. It's, uh, I think the Trans-Mississippi Theater too is interesting uh, because there was a kind of maybe a surprising group of people who were fighting there. Mm -hmm. First of all, we had the, the first and second Kansas, uh, which were the first black uh, units. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Uh, I don't think a lot of people think about, you know, the black, that the first black units were, were in, yeah, the, trans in the Trans-Mississippi Mississippi, Yeah, I think that would surprise people. Yeah. Yeah. And both sides had a Native American contingents. Yes. And it's, it's, I don't think we think about that at all. I think a lot yeah. of times when you look at the Civil War, you don't think about there actually being like dedicated Native American units, but there are actually quite a few mm -hmm. of varying sizes uh, across. I, there were, I mean, there were Native Americans who fought in the, in the East as well, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Indian territory, I, I mean, the Native Americans were, were, had been essentially pushed and pushed and pushed mm -hmm. and they, they, they were in a difficult position. Uh, almost as soon as the war began, the Union uh, vacated Indian territory. They didn't want to staff those forts. They didn't want to uh, 
and that was problematic. Uh, there also was, of course, uh, the Cherokee. There were actually a number of Cherokee slave owners, uh, so to some extent that they they felt like you know they they sympathized with the Confederacy, uh, but they did not fare well after the war either. They essentially found out yeah. that you know the Indian Territory was uh, not going to be theirs. It wasn't going to be autonomous, but, you know, it, and some of that had to do with you know what. Uh, it's, but sympathies, but part of that had uh, to do with the war, though, because we had yeah. increased both the technology and the size of the military and uh, the the expertise of the military. I and mean, the, the the guys that went and fought the what they call them the Indian Wars after the Civil War uh, were experienced officers, and and yeah. uh, so once you know, uh, I mean, they were fighting a different army as a part of the result of the Civil War as well. And yeah, I mean, there's uh, so the I mean that gives you more importance to the West as well, and and what it meant. But you're right. Yeah. I think people are surprised to find out that there were full Native American contingents fighting on both sides yeah. uh, during the the Civil War. Yeah, they were, and it's it's kind of important to remember that they had their own perspective too, because uh, I, I think you get a lot of it. They there were Cherokee slave owners, and it makes sense that they would fight for the South. But I mean, they were uh, also you, in a place they you didn't had trust a lot the of reasons government. to be mad at the federal government if you were Native <laughs> yeah. American in the United States. They, so they were true. trying. I, I mean, it sounds like they were because. Uh, most of the those five civilized tribes that they called them uh, signed treaties with the South, mm -hmm. with the idea that you know the South didn't really want to fight them; they didn't have the resources to do that. And the the Native Americans saw that as an opportunity to kind of you know, protect their sovereignty and yeah. their land. I mean, in some way, it's absolutely great because these people that you've been fighting are now distracted fighting each other. Yeah. Uh, but some were probably seeing an opportunity here where they saw you know the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and uh, you know now we have people that are on a, on a cause. And you know it's interesting too because you can also talk about the galvanized Yankees and. That is that the yeah. way that we ended up staffing the frontier during the Civil War was to take Confederate prisoners and say, you can be a prisoner of war, you can join the Federal Army and go fight in the West where you don't have to fight the Confederacy. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting yeah. that some significant amount of the troops that were fighting on the frontier were actually Confederate troops that had been captured. I mean, I'll, I mean it's certainly the, the, the issues that were in the Indian Wars existed before. As a matter of fact, the very first Medal of Honor by date of service occurred before the Civil War fighting the Apache. Uh, but uh, it's it, certainly the two are related to each other. You can't divorce them from each other. Uh, and yeah. uh, what happened after the Civil War in the West is, was impacted by the battle that was fought in the East. So, I, And you can certainly see, I can certainly understand why... Uh, if you were a Native American, why well, you might see some reason to fight for either side in the war and uh, why the vast majority of them decided that they didn't want to fight in the war and, and yeah. uh, were kind of happy that, that the war meant that their enemy were distracted. And ultimately, uh, it didn't really change their situation. But I mean, these units were both important to both sides. I mean, they, oh, they might have, it, and it they, I mean, they fought bravely. The battle. Yeah. yeah, they fought bravely on both sides. Uh, it's... It is. It's just an interesting piece of the war that I think that we 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 don't talk about a lot about how there were complexities that uh, go beyond you know the you know these traditional kind of broad mm -hmm. narratives and they were they were generally the Trans Mississippi Theater was where most of the native troops fought because that's where and they part of that were. had to do with a, a a theater that had less interest from the from the general yeah. commands and so they were more having to you know find troops wherever they could find troops. Yeah, accept them wherever you could get them. That, there was some specific uh, recruitment from both sides for that for that exact reason, and so they were. I mean, they were also used to scouts and stuff like that. But it's it's an interesting piece of the war that I think just doesn't receive it doesn't receive enough attention. So I thought I thought it was an interesting way for us to talk a little bit about that and about the complexities of combat beyond just the Civil War, but you know, into into the both both into the past and into the future as it turned out. One of the reasons you talk about the trans, trans Mississippi is one of the things that made the Battle of Prairie Grove interesting, and you know it's history yeah. that deserves to be remembered. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.